Hi guys and welcome to a new video. Today I'm going to be talking about Cindy Allinger's brutal murder that happened in 1996 in Washington state. Now this case is officially solved but the more I looked into this case the more doubts I had about the whole case, the whole trial, the whole investigation. So I thought it was a really interesting case to talk about. Now obviously this does mention sexual assault as well as very graphic and brutal murder of a child. So if this is a topic that is too much for you, then please click out. I have a lot of other videos on my channel, including some wholesome hamster content, if that's more your style. But without further ado, let's just get started. Rhonda Plank was a single mother living near the McCord Air Force Base in Washington State. She had three daughters, Brittany, Ashley, and Cindy. July 4th, 1996 was just another summer day for the Plank family. Rhonda was just around the house doing chores while the three girls were outside playing and Rhonda had planned to go down to the waterfront later that day to watch the fireworks. Cindy, whose full name is Cynthia Ann Allinger, was born on March 24th, 1987. And on that July 4th, she was just outside in the neighborhood playing with some friends. And at some point in the afternoon, she found her mom to tell her that she was going to play with one of her friends who lived in an apartment across the street. And the three girls had a very solid rule, which was you could play outside all day, but be back for dinner time. And when Cindy didn't come back for dinner time, Rhonda started looking around the neighborhood just to see where Cindy was. Now she assumed that she was still playing with her friends. Maybe she'd lost track of time. So she started walking around the neighborhood, asking questions, asking if anyone had seen her daughter Cindy or if anyone knew where she was. No one had seen Cindy for a couple of hours and she searched the neighborhood a bit longer with some neighbors. And according to police records, Rhonda reported Cindy missing at 10.53 that very night. The whole neighborhood came in to help find Cindy and by morning they still had no trace of her or no information regarding her whereabouts so things were getting very serious. Cynthia Allinger is described as a nine-year-old white female about four feet tall. She is described as very thin. She has shoulder-length light brown hair or dirty blonde hair and at the time of her disappearance she was wearing a floral pattern dress a white background and pink flowers with green leaves. And the floral pattern is rather large and the dress also has a full circle with a white collar. So those were the descriptions given to neighbors and friends, anyone in the vicinity who could help look for her. And hundreds of people came together to search the area. People volunteered hours and days to look for Cindy. And Rhonda was actually very pleasantly surprised but definitely very surprised that so many people would gather around and take time out of the day to help her find her daughter. After about 48 hours without any information, police started looking into Cindy's parents who were divorced at the time. So they started looking at the dad who had a solid alibi for that afternoon. He wasn't near the area so he was definitely not a suspect but they started looking into Rhonda Plank, so Cindy's mom, who seemed very vague about the information she was providing the police officers. And I know people get very different reactions when it comes to a child missing, and it's not completely fair to judge their reaction because you don't know how you would react in that situation. However, police could not help but feel like she really didn't have a sense of urgency. She didn't seem too concerned. Police listened to the call that Rhonda made to the dispatcher that night. And when the dispatcher asked Rhonda what Cindy was wearing, she couldn't remember. She said, I can't remember. I think she was wearing a dress, which again, you know, if you have three kids and maybe you're busy doing chores around the house, I don't think it's that weird that you wouldn't remember exactly what your child is wearing. Um, if anything, it's a bit more suspicious if you remember in exact detail what they're wearing. But on top of that, she really didn't seem to show much emotion about her daughter missing. She just gave the impression that she didn't seem to care. That's the impression she gave. That doesn't mean she didn't care, but police definitely noted that. Police brought her in for interrogation and they ended up interrogating her from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m., which is a ridiculous amount of time. And she said that it was a complete nightmare. She was afraid she was going to be sent to jail. She took a polygraph test and failed. Now, 
we do know now that polygraph tests are garbage science. However, in the 90s, I think it held a bit more weight and police were a bit suspicious that she failed the polygraph test. But in her defense, she hadn't been sleeping. She hadn't had anything to eat. She was interrogated for hours on end in the middle of the night and she had just lost a daughter. Her daughter was missing. She didn't know where her daughter was. So I don't think it's completely fair and those are not the best circumstances to interrogate anyone. And again, it really isn't fair to judge someone's reaction in a situation you've never been in. But I think it is important to note that the impression she gave people was that she was either very vague or very casual about the whole situation. Now the FBI offered a $5,000 reward for any tips that came through and although many tips came through there was an entire team of officers dedicated to receiving tips and sifting through them. None of them led to anything. This is where things get interesting. After two weeks without any information whatsoever police received a phone call from a member of Rhonda's church. The lady claims that she had seen something in a dream, like a vision, some sort of religious experience. And she told police she had a vision of a young girl lying in a field, either asleep or dead. This lady actually gave police an actual detailed map of the location she saw in her dream or her vision, where she thought the body was located and this was a spot that was half a mile from Cindy's house. And on top of that, this was an area that had been searched by volunteers multiple times, basically on their hands and knees. This was a tip that police could not ignore, even if the source of it was a bit suspicious. You know, I'm sure it happens quite a lot of times. A psychic will call in and say, I had a vision, I can see something and I'm pretty sure it always leads to nothing. But on July 17th, at 8.30 p.m., exactly at the spot described by the psychic, the detective found Cindy Allinger's body. She was wrapped in about four layers of very thick shag carpet and she was placed almost under a water heater. So this was a scene that you couldn't really miss if you had been searching the area. She was laid next to an abandoned house in a field and the autopsy revealed that she had been sexually assaulted, severely beaten, burned with cigarettes and she had suffered a blow to the face so bad that it broke her jaw and teeth were missing. Additionally, she had also been asphyxiated because of her underwear that had been stuffed down her throat. When she was found, her body was already in an advanced state of decomposition. Now, police obviously immediately questioned the psychic who had given the tip over the phone because what were the odds that someone would call in with a vision and discover the body after two weeks without any leads. Police were very intrigued and the psychic always refused to meet police in person. They only spoke over the phone and they provided an alibi for that afternoon. The afternoon Cindy went missing and that was that. I'm not sure how or what alibi they could have provided over the phone, but the psychic was ruled out as a suspect. Due to the nature of the crime, the next step police wanted to take was to interview all 64 registered sex offenders in that area. However, before interviewing them, they needed to know a bit more about when Cindy was murdered and how long the body had been in the field. They brought in a forensic entomologist who wanted to know if the carpet around Cindy's body hindered the insect activity that was found on her body. So he decided to recreate the whole situation using a dead animal. And after monitoring the insect activity, he figured out that the carpet did prevent insects from accessing Cindy's body for an entire day. The result of that research proved that Cindy was murdered either on July 4th or within a day of her disappearance. With that information, police interviewed all sex offenders in that area and all 64 of them had an alibi for that day. So they were back to square one with no lead whatsoever. Now for the next piece of information, I have come across two different versions and I could not find the official one, unfortunately. So police reports claim that Rhonda Plank told 911 dispatcher on the phone that Guy Rasmussen could be involved in Cindy's disappearance 
because one of the neighbors had seen both of them holding hands that day. However, in the Forensic Files episode for this case, it is Ashley's younger sister, who was only seven at the time, who told police that she was playing with Cindy that day, that afternoon, and Cindy decided to just go over to Guy Rasmussen's house to hang out and that was the last Ashley saw of her. So regardless of the source of the information, it definitely seemed like Cindy had been seen with Guy Rasmussen that day. Guy Rasmussen, also known as Raz, was a 30-year-old musician who lived really close to Cindy's house. He often wore tie-dye shirts. He was kind of the hippie next door. He had really long black hair. He was part of a band. He had that whole look about him and Ashley said that Cindy liked going over to Raz's place because he had a dog and she really liked playing with his dog. He also had a drum set in his shed that he would let her play with and when Cindy started hanging out with Raz, Rhonda claims that she didn't know Raz was an adult. She just assumed he was another kid their age but eventually she did find out that Raz was a full-grown adult and she immediately told Cindy that she was no longer allowed to hang out with him because he's not a kid and it's just weird. Police immediately looked into Raz's background to see if he had any prior convictions or if there was anything suspicious in his past and found out that he had been convicted in 1982 for assaulting a 16-year-old and he served a five-year jail sentence for that. and. Then, in 1990, he assaulted a 10-year-old and then served five months for that. Now, how you end up with a five-year sentence after assaulting a 16-year-old and then only five months after a 10-year-old is beyond me. But regardless, he definitely had a past with assaulting underage girls. And if you're wondering why he wasn't part of the 64 registered sex offenders, it's because his last conviction came before the law came into effect. The law that meant that anyone who had assaulted a person needed to be registered as a sex offender. Raz claims that he has been rehabilitated since his last offense, stating, when I think of any sort of sex crime, I get sick to my stomach. Which is, well, how is that not a revelation you have, first of all, before any type of assault, let alone after the assault of a 16-year-old? It, it takes you to assault a 10-year-old to come to the conclusion that, you know what, actually, guys, this really makes me sick to my stomach. I hate this. This is gross. I've completely changed. Like, that's not, I don't know who I was. Um, that's not me. <laughs> so, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not laughing. It's not funny, but... It's absolutely infuriating that he would just provide that information to the police. Like, look, guys, I know what I've done and like I'm new year new me this is not me I swear on top of that he had also been a suspect in two murders but never got convicted because there wasn't enough evidence so this guy definitely has a very suspicious past but obviously that's not enough to convict him you know maybe he had been seen that day with Cindy and he had a very suspicious past, a very concerning past, but that doesn't mean he had anything to do with Cindy. So the day following Cindy's disappearance, they immediately put him under surveillance. They didn't waste any time and they also interrogated him. But in the interrogation, he denied that Cindy had ever been to his home on July 4th. And he also had an alibi. He said he got picked up from a store at 4.15 that afternoon. He got picked up by a friend and then they headed off to a rock festival. Phone records do confirm that he placed a call at 4.15 from the payphone that was next to the store he was at and his friend did pick him up in a car to go to this rock festival. So he had a very solid alibi because Rhonda had told police the last time she saw Cindy was at 4.30 that afternoon. So it couldn't be Raz. So he was eliminated as a suspect, but not for very long because it was a bit it was a bit too convenient and police had nothing else to go with so they decided to listen to Rhonda's call to the 911 dispatcher again and they realized that on that call she told the dispatcher that she had last seen Cindy at three o'clock that afternoon which meant that she was definitely confused about the last time she had seen Cindy it was very blurry so they could no longer eliminate Raz as a suspect and now there was a window between 3 in the afternoon and 4.15 
where anything could have happened, and Guy did not have an alibi for that time frame. As with Rhonda Plank, police made him take a polygraph test, which he failed. However, I, I'm just including it because that is just one of the facts from the police report. It's just a bit worthless. I don't believe in any polygraph test results. However, for what it's worth, he did fail that and police ended up searching through his trash and found a torn up drawing of his dog that Cindy had given him a few weeks earlier. And this drawing had been ripped up and thrown out after her disappearance. So that was definitely a bit suspicious. Things were looking very suspicious. So police got a warrant and confiscated the clothing he had been wearing on July 4th. And when they came into his house, they actually found out that all of his dirty laundry was just sitting in the bathtub. There was like weeks worth of dirty laundry just sitting in there. And the clothing he had worn on July 4th was on the top of that pile. So they confiscated that and sent it for testing to see if they could find any trace of DNA or any link to Cindy's disappearance and Cindy's murder. Forensic scientists found tiny bits of plant material on his shoes and on his socks and they sent them to a forensic botanist to check if there was any link to the flora found in the field where Cindy was found. Over a dozen species were found on the shoes and socks and not only were they an exact match to the plants found in that field next to Cindy's body, but they were at the exact same stage of development, meaning the odds of him picking up th those bits of plant from another field at another time were too slim to not be a match. The t-shirt and shorts that he had been wearing that day were also sent for testing and they found a stain. Now the clothing was pretty dirty and it was also a tie-dye shirt so it wasn't very easy to locate any spots or stains on it. However, they did find a stain on his shirt that was a match to Cindy's blood, also Cindy's DNA. And Additionally, they also found a semen stain on his shorts, although it is important to note that there had been no semen found at the crime scene. There was now very solid evidence. There's DNA proof and there is Cindy's blood on his t-shirt to prove that he was involved in Cindy's murder. Police arrested Raz while he was performing on stage at a local club. When he showed up in court, he was sporting a very different look. He had cut his hair very short and he was now wearing a suit. He no longer had the hippie musician look about him. I believe this was so that he could be taken more seriously in court and he looked very different. And prosecutors believe the following timeline. So on July 4th, Cindy went over to Raz's house to play maybe either with his dog or the drum set. For whichever reason, she decided to hang out with Raz that day. He decided to lure her to an abandoned house several blocks away. Prosecutors believe he told her something along the lines of him wanting to buy a house and fix it up. So he brought her over to this abandoned house. And once he was there, he raped and murdered her and then wrapped her in the carpet and left her in that field. And then walked to the store nearby, made a phone from that payphone to provide himself with an alibi. Guy Rasmussen was charged with aggravated murder, first degree kidnapping, and first degree child rape. The jury couldn't come to a decision on the death penalty, so he was given life in prison without the chance of parole. Until his verdict, he continued to maintain his innocence. He even went on a radio interview, and on that interview, he says that he had only met Cindy once. He claimed that the girl liked animals. I didn't know her really, you know, and I didn't know her parents or anything. When she'd come over, me and my girlfriend at the time said, you need to go home and tell your mom where you're at. Which sounds quite contradictory because if you're just gonna say, look, I've only met her once, and then follow that by saying when she'd come over, that does imply that she came over more than once. Otherwise you would say when she came over. That could be just poor grammar, but we know for a fact that he has met her more than once. Cindy's sister Ashley confirmed that Cindy used to go to his house to play there quite frequently. And Ashley even told police that Raz had given Cindy a stuffed animal. It was a rabbit with a little toy carrot. Now you wouldn't give that to someone you've only met once. And also you wouldn't draw a picture of someone's dog if you'd only met them once. He did have 
Cindy's drawing of his dog. Regardless of the fact that he had definitely met her more than once, hopefully you've noticed a few issues with the verdict and the timeline. I mean, I definitely don't understand how they could say Guy Rasmussen was the one to wrap her up in a carpet, leave her there, and then head off to a concert because hundreds of volunteers searched that field. It was half a mile from the house. That was one of the areas that was searched the most. And it wasn't like they just searched it once. It was repeatedly searched. So you wouldn't miss a rolled up carpet next to a water heater next to an abandoned house. That's, to me, that's just impossible. The timeline for that is just impossible. And the fact that you would miss something so obvious until a psychic calls through to tell you where the body is because she had divine intervention in her dreams. There is no way in hell a psychic told police the exact location of a body and it was just sheer luck. She was just having a good connection that night. And on top of that, she like it was just seems too weird to me. And on top of that, she refused to meet police in person. It's too bizarre, like something's not adding up, someone's not saying something. If you do watch the Forensic Files episode for this case, you would genuinely believe that the psychic was the one who solved the case and that Guy Rasmussen is guilty. And that's that. That's all the information they provide. And they say it in a way where it's just, that's that. That's the case. That's what happened. No questions asked. However, after a little deep dive into this case, I found a very controversial part to it. Now. This case is actually featured in Forensic Victimology, Examining Violent Crime Victims in Investigative and Legal Context by Brent Turvey and Wayne Pethrick. I hope I'm saying that right. In this case study, they talk about how police quickly focused their attention on Raz because police found out he was seen with Cindy that day and also they looked into his past. So within 24 hours, he was under surveillance. Now, Raz told detectives that he believes the only reason they're focusing on him is because of his criminal record. And he's saying, it's my past coming up to haunt me. Which makes a lot of sense. I mean, they did interview all 64 sex offenders in the area. That's the first thing they did. So if you have a past such as Raz's past, which is to assault not only a 16-year-old girl, but a 10-year-old girl, which is very close to Cindy's age. Cindy was nine. You can't be upset about police looking into your alibi for that day, especially because you live nearby. You, you, you don't get to turn around and be upset. Like, look, this is just my past coming to haunt me. For what he's done, permission to have his past haunt him every single day for the rest of his life. You don't get to just live in peace forever. Like, you don't get to just move on and be like, look, guy is my bad. And just move, that's j <sighs> okay. I'm just going to move on to the actual case study but Raz basically just thinks that it's just his past coming to haunt him they have nothing on him they just think he did it because he has a past however the issue with this case is that Barbara Corey Boulay was the lead prosecutor for this case and I was actually shocked when I read this because she was openly harassing defense experts and she jailed an 11 year old as a witness to frighten her into giving a prosecution-friendly testimony. The lead prosecutor is also accused of being involved in evidence tampering. And bear in mind, this case was happening while she and her husband, Francis Corey Boulay, were under investigation for theft and fraud at his former place of work. So these are not people who are how you're still able to be a prosecutor while being under investigation for theft and fraud is beyond me. But the biggest issue with this case is that the 11 year old in question, Sierra Hall, was an honor student who had originally told investigators that she had seen Cindy with Raz on the day Cindy went missing. And basically if she testified in court, that would really help prove that Raz committed this murder. The reason prosecutors claimed that they had to jail an 11 year old as a witness in a murder trial was because on May 28th, 1998, Sierra Hall did not show up for a court ordered pretrial interview with defense lawyers. So, <laughs> 
So as a result, she was arrested at Edison Elementary School the next day, moments before receiving an award for Student of the Month. Prosecutors said we're hoping to hold her for 12 hours, maximum 18 hours. However, the Superior Court judge who was supposed to speak to her wasn't available that Friday afternoon, so Sierra Hall ended up spending the weekend in juvenile jail, which is absolutely wild. On Monday, they brought her into the court in chains, which attorneys claim is just standard procedure. However, it's only st it's standard procedure for criminals, not for witnesses, <laughs> not for innocent people, especially not an 11 year old who just spent a weekend at 11. That must have been absolutely terrifying. And I just like, I'm still trying to wrap my head around the whole concept of jailing an 11 year old because she didn't show up at an interview. Basically, it is believed that they were trying to intimidate her into testifying in court. Her family had quickly said, we want nothing to do with this anymore. They wanted to move out of state. They wanted to just be left alone. They were absolutely appalled with how they handled the whole situation. They tried to start a lawsuit against the prosecutors. However, it was dismissed because they claim her arrest, detention, and placement in jail were lawful acts by the civil court, which is even more infuriating. So the family got nothing in return. This poor 11-year-old girl spent a weekend in jail. And the worst part being is that she was arrested at school. Like, imagine arresting an 11-year-old who's just a witness. Like, she's not a suspect or anything. She was arrested because she failed to show up to the court-ordered pretrial interview because she didn't have transportation. That's why she didn't show up. She's 11. She didn't just decide to, like, she didn't just wake up and thought, mm, you know what, I just can't really be bothered today with this whole court-ordered pretrial thing. She's 11, okay? She just, like, she didn't have transportation. No one could bring her there. She missed it. So she got arrested the next day. <clears throat> So that's the first part of the controversy. The second part being that the defense attorneys tried to argue that the key evidence linking Raz to the murder, to the victim's death, was likely planted. So if you remember, Cindy's DNA, Cindy's blood, was found on a stain on Raz's shirt. However, what's important to know is that a specimen of Cindy's spleen was kept in storage for future testing. They kept her spleen in a bag, in a storage unit, and in that same location, so in that same room where all the evidence was locked up, they also kept Raz's clothes in a separate bag, obviously. But this room was not monitored. There was no CCTV. It was just like a room you could just walk into and left unsupervised. And the defense team said that the experts in California who were testing the blood stain on Raz's shirt noticed a strong odor of chemicals when they opened the bags containing the clothing. And the scientists who tested that believed that the chemicals could have been the preservative used to treat the girl's spleen for storage. It's a very specific type of chemical smell, I believe. And it suggests that the evidence was planted because everything was left unattended in the room and anyone could just walk in unsupervised, unobserved. The defense attorneys were trying to explain that the only reason you could smell these chemicals when opening the bag of clothing is, is if there had been some sort of cross-contamination. The, the bag with the spleen in it would have to have been opened as well. Problem number three is when the defense team asked for a CPS reports and prosecutors denied that CPS reports were relevant in this investigation, which inadvertently prove that there were CPS reports. Because if there hadn't been any, they would just say, there are none, so problem solved. No point looking into them, there aren't any. So basically the defense team was trying to bring in CPS reports. The prosecutor said, look, this has nothing to do with the CPS report. And then the defense team was like, all right, so there are CPS reports. So by the end of the trial, they find out that Rhonda's boyfriend at the time, David Bauschmann, I'm not saying that right, David Bauschmann, I'm sorry if I'm not, we'll just call him David, had been jailed due to a first degree assault on January 21st, 1999. He had, and this was not the first time, but he had choked and beaten Rhonda Plank. So basically Rhonda's boyfriend at the time had a history of violent abuse and physical abuse. And 
As a response, David's lawyer sent a letter to the prosecutors stating that Rhonda was the one who had murdered Cindy. In the letter, it is explained that Rhonda killed her own daughter with a 14 inch long plywood paddle which she allegedly used to discipline all three of her daughters. The letter also mentioned that she has stuffed something down Cindy's throat to stop her from crying out, which that in itself does match up the autopsy report because Cindy had been asphyxiated with her underwear being stuffed down her throat. So that part of the letter could be a co like could be a match. However, it doesn't explain the rest of the abuse she suffered, the sexual abuse, the cigarette burns, anything like that. It was such a brutal murder. It had nothing to do with the 14 inch long plywood paddle at all. David ended up admitting that he had made up the whole thing. He had lied about Rhonda killing Cindy. He was just upset because Rhonda was making him look bad to the neighborhood and in court because of his own actions. So as a result, he tried to accuse her of murdering her own daughter. So I've looked online for a bit more information. Now, the most information I could find came from a true crime discussion forum. So obviously the information I'm about to give you, I could not find any evidence of it. So take that with a grain of salt. However, multiple people mentioned the fact that the detective who found Cindy's body had actually moved her body before calling it in. Allegedly, the detective went out alone on the night of July 17th, found the body, and despite orders, moved it before anyone else could arrive to document the scene the next morning. Additionally, and this is also allegedly, the psychic who called in regarding the vision and locating Cindy's body, was the spiritual guide of Gilbert Bauschman, who is David Bauschman's dad, who was Rhonda's partner at the time. So David was Rhonda's partner, and then David's dad's spiritual guide was the psychic who called in the location of the body. So if that's true, that is extremely fishy. Like there's definitely something more going on. And honestly, with all the information I came across, it sounds like the prosecutors only wanted to nail Guy Rasmussen as the suspect. It doesn't look like they were trying to get to the bottom of it. They weren't trying to find out what really happened to Cindy. They just wanted to find someone to blame. And I'm not saying I believe Raz is innocent, however, it definitely wasn't a fair trial and there's a lot more going on that we don't know about and it's just it just reeks of shady police work and shoddy police work to be honest so guy rasmussen is now seeking to retest the dna evidence that helped convict him the news tribune reports that attorneys for guy rasmussen have asked a pierce county superior court judge to allow dna evidence collected in the case to be retested using modern technology the lawyers with the Innocence Project Northwest argue that DNA tests used at the time of his arrest and conviction were rudimentary. Current Pierce County prosecutors and a former one who prosecuted Rasmussen say they do not oppose retesting and they are confident it will confirm his guilt. Cynthia Allinger was buried in Mountain View Memorial Park in Lakewood, Washington State, and her official date of death is July 4th, 1996. The neighbors say that nothing was ever the same after Cindy's murder, where they used to see kids running around the streets playing on their own. And after her disappearance and her murder, then kids were too afraid to play on their own. And you could always find them in pairs because there was no reason for Cindy to be targeted. This could have happened to anyone. That's it for today's case, you guys. Please comment down below if you think that this case is very suspicious, if there's more that's not being said. Please let me know if you have any other cases you'd like me to cover and please like and subscribe if you like true crime content. I will see you in the next video. Bye.